board. And upload and share the screen. Okay, folks, thank you so much for coming to the fifth SHIELD webinar. And we have the immense pleasure today to have Susie Dodd. And we hope we will have our second guest. Uh, and hold on one second. I just want to, um, one second, open. One second, folks. Okay, one, one second. Okay, great. Now we can start rolling. Okay, so um, my computer decided to do all sorts of weird stuff today. And it's coming up, hold on. Okay, so um, I'm going to share my screen. And we have our SHIELD webinar that is in the second Friday of every month. And today we are going to have, um, if my PowerPoint works, um, Susie Dodd and hopefully Charlie Skullhouse will be able to dial in. He's having a problem with his um, Zoom. Not as bad as I'm having, but uh, uh, he's not being able to log in. Hopefully he will be able to call oh, in. So um, Susie Dodd um, is the current program project manager for Voyager. Um, and she work um, also She's a director for the um, Interplanetary Network a directory that is responsible for communicating with all the amazing satellites. And I'm excited to hear from Susie how this work is going. Um, she became the Voyager project manager in 2010. She worked at Voyager many, many years ago. So she's going to tell us about it, how she got back to working with Voyager. Um, now, the DCN that is responsible for us talking to the spacecraft is a very broad and wide um, network, very complex. And um, Susie will tell us, Opa, what is that? My phone started thinking. And she worked at Caltech in Spitzer when I was there too. Oh when Spitzer was just being I launched. Just, I, I've, um, two people are talking at the same time, but I think it's my problem. I think I'm somehow down. Okay, and so she worked at Caltech in Spitzer. She also worked in the long wavelengths astrophysics. She also worked in the Cassini mission, in the Mars project, in the Voyager Uranus, in Neptune mission. So it's a wide and broad careers that we're very excited to hear about. Um, hopefully, Charlie uh, will be able to um, call in and I can advance the slides for him. Um, he is um, an engineer that work in the golden era of Voyager um, that has amazing exploration by Mariner, Viking, 
um, and uh, Cassini mission. He was um, responsible for all the um, great crews of Voyager for the outer planets. So I was looking forward to hearing all these stories from Charlie. Um, if he doesn't get to be able to call in, we will have him come back. Let me, before we start, just to, uh, here's a picture of him and Ed Stone that Susie just sent me. It's a great picture. Um, we are going to record this webinar and put it in our SHIELD uh, website as usual. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a very short overview of SHIELD before we pass um, the stage to Susie. This is a center that uh, started funded by NASA um, a year ago. We are in phase one. We hope to go for phase two for five more years. And the goal of SHIELD is as uh, seen here in this picture to study our SHIELD in the galaxy, um, the SHIELD galactic cosmic race and understand the properties of our astrosphere. So the big vision is that we will, by the end of um, the lifetime of the center, have a predictive model and should stand for solar wind and hydrogen ion charge exchange and large scale dynamics. Um, we have a bunch of people um, connected to it. They're all observers, theoreticians. They do all sorts of modeling from large scales to small scales. Uh, you can check out in the website down below um, um, shown here, all the activities we're doing. Um, and what is behind that, that we always uh, make this plug to remind people that our heliosphere is the only known so far of a habitable astrosphere. So we need to understand the properties of this um, astrospheres in order to predict how it's shielded from formation of solar system within it. Um, okay, um, here is a, a screenshot of the website that describe all our exciting activities. In terms of outreach, we have something that if you're listening and you're interested in taking part, please email us both in my email shown here or in Shield Outreach, um, where we had students um, in not in just in BU, but in other institutions talking about their goal and challenges of becoming a scientist um, from you know, Benja being, you know, the first student um, from a family that never been to college for being a gender fluid student, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and such a candid and beautiful testimonials. Um, and we call it, you can be what you cannot see. So anyway, um, please reach out if you're interested. We also will have a survey at the end of the webinar and the link is below and Rachel is going to put in the chat the link as well um, for you to participate and tell us what you like about the event, what you didn't like, if you have more suggestions. Um, and finally, um, next um, month, we're going to start a Young Voice uh, webinar where within the SHIELD webinars, we are going to have young researchers talking about their career and their um, science that they're doing. So we're pretty excited with that. Instead of having the typical colloquium, we will have um, highlight the young voices. Um, so Susie, you want to start? You want to share your screen? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, do, you, do you want me to share my screen or do you want to show the slides, Marav? I think it's easier if you could share your screen. Easier, okay. but it doesn't matter. Is <laughs> okay, I will try. Let's see. Uh, if it, if it doesn't work, I will share. Okay. My internet is slightly slower, so I think it would be better if you do it, but okay. Uh, go either way. Desktop share. Okay, are you seeing my desktop? Yes, worked. Perfect. Okay, I will then. Okay, if I put this on full screen, it will work. It will work. How is that? Can you see Fantastic. me? Fantastic. Fabulous. Okay, great. Okay. So um, the picture you see here is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. It actually looks pretty much like this today because we just got some uh, rain this week. So there is a dusting of snow up on the mountains above JPL currently. 
Um, I thought for this presentation, I would just uh, give you a little bit of my background. I think uh, Marab wanted uh, folks to understand what my background was a little bit in my career path. Um, and then talk a little bit about the Voyager interstellar mission, not, not so much about the Voyager planetary mission, but um, we can, I, I saw that on the line, there are a few experts here. So uh, I'm sure if I trip up, they will uh, correct me. Um, <laughs> anyway, Voyager is, is truly the voyage of a lifetime. And, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. So how did I get to where I am? Uh, the picture here, uh, hopefully people recognize their mountains. That's Mount Rainier. So that's Washington State. And I grew up in a small town called Gig Harbor, Washington, which is uh, south of Seattle, uh, west of Tacoma, across the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, if, you're, if you're familiar with your high school or early college physics classes where the bridge falls down due to the the harmonic set up by the wind, that is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Uh, this, this town, Gig Harbor, is on uh, across the bridge from Tacoma. It's a, it's a fishing village. It was, uh, as you can tell by the picture, very, uh, very beautiful, very idyllic, uh, kind of a fun um, country place to grow up. I did, I did do a lot on the water as a kid, um, a lot of salmon fishing and things like that. Um, and uh, when I went to college, I, I first went to a school called Whitman College, which is in Walla Walla, Washington. And that's on the east side of the Cascades. It's about as far away from the, from, uh, the Tacoma, Seattle area, the Puget Sound area as you can get. Um, and, but, but Whitman College had a special 3-2 program with Caltech. Uh, meaning that it, you could get a, uh, a bachelor's degree basically from each, each school in five years. You went three years to Whitman and two years to Caltech and you ended up with two bachelor's degrees. So that's, that's what I did. For, from Whitman, I have a bachelor's degree in math and from Caltech, I have a bachelor's degree in um, mechanical engineering. And when I uh, left Caltech, uh, I graduated in 1984. So you, you, can all, you can all calculate my age by that. <laughs> um, I started working at JPL and I actually started working at JPL. And, and, and I think everybody's familiar enough that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory done it. Is, so, op, is operated. Just stay here for your meeting then. Okay, yeah. somebody's got an open mic. It's uh, John. John, okay. John. I'm going to mute him. <laughs> <laughs> Shame, shame. Yeah, that's right. Shame, shame. Shame, shame. <laughs> you can all shame John. Um, <laughs> right. So I actually started working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Are you going somewhere, right? John, your mic. Yeah, is I just still... muted. I just muted him. Okay, thank you, Mom. Um, I started at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory about a month before I graduated from Caltech. And uh, I started on the Voyager project. And uh, it, it, they were just, it was about a year and a half ahead of the Uranus encounter. So I, I, I missed the launch and I missed the Jupiter and Saturn encounters for Voyager, but I started as an entry level engineer um, building sequence, designing and building sequence commands um, during for the Uranus encounter. And uh, while I was at JPL uh, and working on Voyager, I actually uh, spent a, a slow roll getting a master's degree from USC at night. Um, and I ended up getting that about four years later in aerospace engineering. And then my last career highlight was only a couple of years ago, actually, I think it was in 2018, uh, as a Voyager project manager, uh, I was awarded an honorary degree from NYU along with Ed Stone and uh, John Cassani. Um, and so we got to go to the NYU graduation and uh, which was held in Yankee Stadium. That was pretty neat, uh, although it was raining that day. But uh, probably the neatest part about that besides doing a graduation and getting an honorary degree was that their main con commencement speaker was uh, Justin Trudeau, the premier of Canada, and uh, he was right behind us. So we got a lot of good photo opportunities with him. That's great. <laughs> uh, 
But so, uh, so that's my educational highlights uh, and, and my background. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mentioned that uh, primarily my background is, is engineering typically, but when you, when you come to a place like JPL, uh, you're put into, you know, there's not any jobs that are really directly applicable. Um, some of the jobs of building spacecraft are more applicable, but operating a spacecraft really is, is uh, you need some sort of technical background, but it's, but you learn it on the, you learn it on the fly, I guess is maybe the best way to say it. You learn it by doing it. Um, and so I mentioned, uh, obviously there's a picture of Voyager in the lower right hand corner here. And I mentioned that's what I started on. I, I, I did sequencing and operations for the Uranus and Neptune encounter. So I spent about six years on Voyager. I moved off of Voyager onto a mission called Mars Observer. That's in the center top. Uh, from Mars Observer, I worked in the mission planning area. And Mars Observer, you don't hear much about because that's actually a failed mission. Uh, it launched, but it never got into orbit around Mars. It had an issue with uh, uh, the propulsion system and the, and the burn. I, th I think what they think happened is that the, actually, the ignition actually happened in one of the fuel lines instead of in the engine. And so it was never captured in, in orbit. And uh, so it was a mission that was not successful. And I would just say that you can probably learn as much from missions that are not successful as ones that are successful. The first and foremost thing you can learn is not everything is gonna be successful. So sure. <laughs> pay attention to what you're doing. Just because you did it, <laughs> just because you did it once uh, doesn't mean you're gonna be able to do it again um, right. successfully. So you, you always need to be testing and checking things out. So I spent about three years on Mars Observer, and then I moved to uh, Cassini, which is the one on the lower left. I think people are pretty familiar with Cassini. Uh, I actually worked on Cassini before it launched. I helped de design their uplink system and their mission planning teams. Um, it launched in 1996, I believe. And I worked uh, for about three to four years before launch on Cassini, and then about a year and a half after Cassini. Cassini took pretty close to seven years to get to Saturn. Obviously, Saturn's a long ways out there. Um, Cassini is, size-wise, Cassini's probably about twice as big as Voyager. It's kind of humongous and really big, and uh, there's a lot of history about how it got started, but uh, obviously very successful, um, very successful at, at at Saturn. I never worked in the actual, um, I never worked for once it got to Saturn. I actually left before the, before it got there, but I helped design the operation systems basically that it used. And uh, I, then my career took a little bit of a right turn because I went uh, from JPL to Caltech campus in 2000 for uh, about 10 years. And I worked on the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is up in the uh, upper right-hand corner. And if you're an astrophysicist, you should be probably pretty familiar with Spitzer. It's an infrared telescope, one of the great observatories in the line of four great observatories. It also uh, just ended. It uh, launched in uh, 2003, and it just ended at, in, I think, 2019 after about 16 years and, and Spitzer was a great mission. I actually worked in the science, the science center, the science operations center was on campus. And um, I, went, I went there for a little bit of a change in what I was doing. And um, I also think that it was a, a good move because working with scientists as opposed to working with engineers, I really was able to understand how they think what's important to them and then um, provide that uh, context and crossover when communicating with the engineers. So um, that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to work uh, on a telescope and astrophysics. It was a lot of fun to work with the science teams. Um, uh, and I did that for like 10 years. And then at the same time, 
at the same time I was working on Spitzer, I also started to get involved with the infrared archives that uh, are housed at IPAC. And uh, so I got to learn about the archiving of science data as well. <clears throat> but in, 20, in 2010, the project manager for Voyager uh, was leaving, as was the project manager for Spitzer. Spitzer is a project that's operated out of JPL, but the Science Center is at campus. And so I got asked to come back and uh, if I would be, uh, both were extended missions, so they didn't need full-time project managers. So I was asked to come back to be a project manager on, on those two missions. And, and I agreed, so I came back from campus back up to JPL uh, and, and physically, Caltech and JPL are separated by about five miles, so it's not that far apart. But um, um, I came back as a Voyager project manager in 2010 after leaving, being gone basically for 20 years. And the first thing that struck me was that many of the engineers were still people I knew from 20 years ago. In other words, they had stayed on the project from, uh, you know, from the planetary days for, for the next uh, 20 plus years to fly the interstellar mission. And um, the other thing that was probably pretty startling uh, is that, you know, in the planetary days, there'd be 200, 250 people flying this project. Uh, we now fly the project with less than 12 uh, engineers for, for two spacecraft. So I'll get into talking a little bit more about Voyager later. Um, uh, and then, um, I also picked up in the upper left-hand corner is New Star, which is another astrophysics small explorer. Susie, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Um, that I, I probably should <clears throat> reserve to ask at the end, but it's just, it's in my head as you're mentioning. The, when you came back to Voyager, the cultural Voyager, and there is each mission has their own culture, you know, so, socio, whatever, you know, if you, if you want to say something about it here, we can talk about it later. Um, I think the culture of Voyager is very much what it was like during the planetary mission, just with mm -hmm. a lot smaller group of people. Gee, because the yeah. most of the PIs were the same, most of the science people were the same. Uh, uh, at least if they were involved in fields and particles and, and, mag, and mag fields. Um, but we could talk a little bit more about okay, that. Okay, okay, cool, later. cool. Um, so um, <clears throat> anyway, in the upper left-hand corner is, is New Star, the uh, Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array, kind of a complicated name, but it's, it's a small explorer. And um, I also picked that up for a few years as the project manager. So at one point I was the project manager for Voyager, uh, Spitzer and New Star. Uh, but in 2016, um, uh, we got a new director at JPL, Dr. Michael Watkins, and he made some changes. And I, I asked if I would take over as uh, the director for the Interplanetary Network. Uh, and, the Interten and the Interplanetary Network is in charge of AMIS, which is the multi-mission software group, and also the Deep Space Network with the DSN. And um, I agreed to do that. Uh, and at the time, I think he wanted me to drop all the missions that I was project manager for. And I said, can I just hang on to Voyager a little bit? Cause you know, you're, it's like your first love. It was the first mission I started on. Can I see if I can do both uh, the directorate job and the Voyager project manager job? And, and he let me. And so uh, five years later, I, I, I balanced that work and I'm still able to do it. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that I am. And I'll, I'll tell a story, a little, some stories later about how, well, I guess I can say it now, you know, Voyager and the DSN are intimately connected uh, because of Voyager's distance. And you can't answer a question about Voyager without talking about how we communicate with it, with the DSN. And then you can't answer a question uh, about the DSN without saying, you know, you, you, we communicate if, as, yeah, as far away as interstellar space with Voyager. So it's, it's kind of fun because um, whether I give a talk about Voyager or I give a talk about the Deep Space Network, the other topic always comes up. Uh, okay, so I'll run through just a few slides. Uh, Marav, I'm also not paying attention to the time. So let me Go know. Go ahead, you, we are good. Let me know yeah. if you need me to speed up. Okay, good. Um, so Voyager is really the grandest tour here. Uh, 
it was launched in 1977. There are two, two spacecraft. Uh, Voyager 2 was actually launched first, so it's the longest operating spacecraft. Uh, Voyager 1 was launched second, uh, but it's faster, so it's the furthest distance spacecraft. And the original mission was um, a mission to Jupiter and Saturn. You can see the dates on here in, in 79 and 8081. Uh, it got an extension to go out to Uranus, uh, which is when I joined the program out there in Jan. So it did the Uranus and Canner in January 80, 1986. It, did, it got another extension to go out to Neptune. And this is just with Voyager 2. Um, it got past Neptune in 1989. That's when I left the project after that. A lot of other people left the project after that, but a, a, a small and dedicated group of people stayed with the project. And I, I um, uh, when I became the project manager, actually, uh, in 2010, I got an email from Frank Carr, who I think at the time was the program executive at NASA. And he said that the Voyager interstellar mission uh, was sold because they said that they would get to the uh, helioposit 50 AU <laughs> and, you know, and Neptune's at 30 AU. So they only had 20 more AU to get there. Well, we didn't get to Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 both didn't get to uh, interstellar space until 121 AU. So, uh, so the scientists did a good job of selling uh, the heliopause much closer to us than it actually is. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, it's a great mission. Uh, it, it continues to operate well and, and it's really invaluable data because it's the only in situ mission in interstellar space and in the outer helios heliosphere and, and beyond the local interstellar mission. And, you know, one of the things I like about Voyagers, I like to say, you know, it went from a planetary mission to a heliophysics mission. And, and now, uh, you know, the kind of people that are interested in it are actually astrophysicists. So it's, it's, it's really changed over the decades that it's been flying in the type of science it's done and the community of scientists that are involved with it. Right, right. Um, so just real quickly, I wanted to share some of the things about operating Voyager now. Now we have extremely long round trip light times and, and very low data rates. So for Voyager 1, which is further out, um, the round trip light time is I think 42 hours now. And um, our regular data bit rate is only 160 bits per second. So we use, um, Voyager was redesigned basically after the Neptune flyby to use repetitive uh, on, stored on board command blocks. And there was also an emphasis put into the fault protection because the spacecraft really is on its own out there. But we can't, if it has some kind of an issue, it's, it has to be able to take care of itself. Um, we do have a backup mission load in case communication fails. If it, it doesn't hear from us uh, in an, in an expected amount of time, it will try switching some of its telecommunication systems in the end, it will say, well, hey, my receiver failed, so I'll just keep transmitting data back to the Earth type thing. And we have an onboard algorithm that keeps the antenna pointed at the Earth. Um, and so that should, that, that functions, as long as our, our attitude control thrusters can control the antenna, the antenna knows where to point. Um, and the other, the other model here is we only send data back in real time with one exception. On, on Voyager 1, we have uh, a tape recorder, <laughs> believe it or not, but it's an eight track digital tape recorder. We probably have the only person in the world, uh, <laughs> Larry Zottarelli, that knows how to run that. And he's, he's you know in his mid eighties now, but he works, uh, has a retiree for us to, to manage that. But we do, ma we do tape, tape record or record um, high rate plasma wave data and play that back twice a year. And to, do, to get a playback, and this is not a large playback, it's, it's 1400 bits per second, takes all of the DS antennas at the site, takes a 70 meter and three 34 meter antennas array to get that data back. So uh, Voyager, because it's so far out, is a kind of a big DSN hog, but we'll, I'll, I'll get into the DSN in a, in a bit. 
Um, and I think another thing about these long duration missions, and I've been working some with the folks that are Ralph McNutt and others who have been talking about interstellar probe, um, is these long duration missions that, that knowledge capture and documentation are really important. Right. Um, um, and how do you how do you get that? I mean, everything at Voyager was originally in paper, right? Um, nothing was electronic back in the mid 70s. Yeah. So we, we spent a lot of time um, scanning documents um, and putting them online. But what I've found is a lot of documents say what the decision was, but they don't say how they reached that decision. And they don't always talk about why they made the decision they did. And uh, we are constantly, as we push the envelope of how we operate the spacecraft, uh, we are constantly trying to understand why somebody made a certain decision. Um, we recently, recently, well, within the last five or six years, wanted to have some information about uh, the attitude control system and why they had put this certain safety check in the flight software. And uh, when we talked to the engineer who luckily still worked at JPL, when we talked to him, he said, well, I don't really remember, but you know, we could show him the memo. So I don't really remember, but I'm sure that we didn't think the mission was gonna last past the year 2000. So <laughs> we didn't worry about anything past that time. So, um, so those are kind of, kind of the really I would say fun and interesting challenges that you have with a very extended mission. And also Voyager's a mission that's, that wasn't designed to be a long duration mission, right? It's just been very fortuitous that it's lasted as long as it has. Um, I think a lot of the credit there goes to the flight team because the same people, you know, our technical experts basically all have been with the flight team, some of them more than 35 years. Um, I think everyone mostly 10 to 15 years and we're starting to <laughs> we're starting to cycle back a few engineers people like me who who worked on it in Uranus and Neptune and kind of uh looking toward the end of their careers are saying wouldn't it be great to get back on Voyager and ride my last five or six years out of, right. of, of work on the project I started on so that's really fun too and and they do have a certain amount of knowledge I mean we haven't changed the spacecraft in 40 years so um, it, it's fun. And, you know, I, I mentioned down the last bullet here is you, you should, you should, uh, maintain a list of retirees. Cause that gets to be real important when you're trying to, uh, remember how things were done or figure out why things were originally designed the way they were. Um, now a couple of the current challenges we have from an engineering standpoint is that there are two spacecraft and they, they operate differently. They have different degradations. I like to think of them as like twin sisters and one of them no longer hears well, that's Voyager 2. Um, one of them has, has lost a lot of their sense of touch in the case of Voyager 1. So they have this, they're built identical, but they, they have failed differently over the years. Um, the overarching and you know, most immediate need with Voyager is to keep enough power and thermal margin to keep the spacecraft operating. Their, nu their nuclear power uh, supplied RTGs, um, they lose four watts of power a year. So we're at the point now in the mission where we, we've started for Voyager 2, turning off instrument heaters. And then if the, if the instrument still works, we'll leave the instrument on. Um, if it doesn't work, then we'll turn the instrument itself off. That's a, that's a, to save enough power to um, continue to operate the rest of the instruments and get science data back. There are components we use solely as heaters. The, the tape recorder on, on Voyager 2, we leave on uh, because its location heats the propellant lines and we don't want the propellant lines to freeze. So that's why we, we leave some components on. Um, it's, a, it's a bit like uh, heating your room with your light bulb, um, that type of thing. Uh, but the, the, the trade is always between uh, power and thermal. There are, there are things we would like to turn off, but we don't because it'll make the spacecraft too cold. Um, some of the other challenges include, you know, obviously the aging hardware and, and software, but that's not just the, the spacecraft, it's also on the ground. Um, yeah, especially in recent decade or so with a real 
ramp up in cybersecurity and operating systems. We have to keep our ground software up to date. And that, that's as much of a challenge as, as keeping up with the aging spacecraft. Uh, we don't have a test bed. We have very little limited memory. I think everybody's probably heard, uh, you know, that your, actually your key, your car key fob has more memory than are in the Voyager spacecraft by, <laughs> you know, hundreds of orders of magnitude. So it's, it's, uh, uh, you can't do a lot with the spacecraft from a memory uh, standpoint. Um, it's, so our, our engineers, it's a little bit like paying, playing Tetris. They try to squeeze in all the activities we want in the limited memory they have. That's why the onboard blocks help also. But you have to be, you have to be, you have to know how to do that. And I think, you know, a modern day spacecraft has, you know, so much more memory. They don't have to be efficient with their memory, really. So the way we do. Um, okay. Let's see. I won't talk too much about science other than that, um, list what they are here. I, I think, you know, Marav is intermittently familiar with these. Um, my personal um, interest, though, has to do with the shape of the heliosphere. If you, the three pictures in the upper right hand corner represent three different models. The, the top one is sort of the classical um, co um, comet shaped tail to the hel heliosphere. Uh, Marav and her uh, collaborators have come up with a model that's more uh, croissant shape. And then the LACP folks, Dr. Tom Kramegis, feel it's more spherical. So, uh, you know, how do you resolve this? Well, you'll resolve this uh, through um, uh, data. And, you know, I always like to tell people it's great that we have two spacecraft because then we have two data points and, and you have to fit your models to two data points, not just one. And um, it, it, the, the, our science team meetings are very interesting because a lot of talk is, is spent about the, the shape and how the shape of the heliosphere, how the magnetic fields interact between the heliosphere's magnetic, uh, magnetic field and that of the local interstellar medium. Um, and then there's there's questions about is there is there a bow shock we we don't know um, how is the, what's happening at the the boundary what's happening with the structure at the boundary and uh, you know what are the what are the elementary particles do we see what are the abundances of these so we can take this in situ Voyager data and then combine it with missions like IBEX and uh, IMAP I think in the future to make to make a better model of what's going on with um, out there right on the boundary of, of our heliosphere. Okay, yeah, I said I would get back a little bit to the deep space network. So um, the deep space network is uh, a collection of an antennas located around the world. I didn't bring my little map here, but it's there's three sites of these. They're equal distance around the globe. Uh, you've got Goldstone, California, which is in the California desert, halfway between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. You've got Madrid, Spain, just outside there. And you have uh, outside of Canberra, Australia, so on the eastern side of Australia. And um, this is how we talk to deep space missions. Actually, we can talk to anything uh, above geo. Uh, really, and we can talk to the moon and we can talk to interstellar space. Uh, uh, each antenna site has a 70 meter antenna, which is the big image shown here, plus uh, three 34 meter antennas. We would like to be, we're in the process, we have a plan, I guess a long-term plan to build out another 34 meter at each site. <clears throat> We've already done that in, in Spain. Uh, the next one, we've done some uh, groundbreaking in, in Goldstone for the next 34 meter antenna. And it, it, uh, the idea is that the capture, if you array four 34 meter antennas, it gives you the same capture as a 70 meter antenna. So, um, but the 70 meter antennas are old, uh, you know, they come from the 60s. So they're on their, their 50 plus years and um, they need a lot of maintenance and, um, but they're definitely what's needed uh, for communications with a Voyager spacecraft. And I think 
Voyager 2, because it's so far uh, down and out of the ecliptic plane, about a 42 degree angle out of the ecliptic plane, it can only talk to the Southern hemisphere. And uh, so the 70 meter antenna in, in Canberra is the only antenna with a S band uplink that can talk to Voyager. And we, we actually just completed, they just completed at a, a 11 month downtime to refurbish that antenna, the 70 meter in Australia. And so for 11 months, we had no commanding ability, capability for Voyager 2. So we basically put the Voyager 2 in a quiescent mode. We set a command loss timer to more than a year. So if it didn't hear from us for more than a year, it wouldn't worry about it. And that antenna just came back online um, in February and it works great and we can communicate with Voyager 2 and it should last now. I mean, that, that upgrade should last us for another 25 years. So, and uh, the picture in the and the picture in the lower left hand corner is me touching the seventy meter antenna uh, in Australia. They can bend it all the way over to the ground. Um, uh, I'm kind of short compared to my host there, but you can tell I'm in Australia because I have the umbrella. You're way taller the, than me, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> and the umbrella with the uh, Australian flag on it. So. Um, and so the deep space network, where, where are we going in the future? Um, uh, well, we're, we're building new antennas. I mentioned that already. Uh, we're trying to move to higher frequencies too, uh, things like KA band and also optical communications. That way you can get <clears throat> more data down in less duration um, and pack, pack it higher. The, the picture on the upper right is the new antennas uh, we're actually building two new antennas in Spain. One is finished, but that's an example of how they get put the, together. And then in the right, we're, we're working on optical communications where we take this RF antenna, but the center of it is actually optical and the outside is then the RF part of it. We have a design for that. Uh, we're hoping to get additional funding to complete that design. And we're hoping to move more deep space missions to optical. There is a uh, technology demonstration mission, uh, or sorry, demonstration instrument on the Psyche mission. Um, Psyche goes out to the asteroids Psyche, which is in the asteroid belt. So we'll be able to <clears throat> demonstrate, hopefully the plan is to demonstrate using um, the deep space optical comm terminal on Psyche to demonstrate on the ground uh, a design for um, optical from deep space from about the Mars, you know, the Mars range. Um, and we also look into better coding, coding algorithms, uh, ways to uh, do uh, multiple, uh, what do I say, arrayed uplinks and things like that to be more efficient with our antennas. Um, things like uh, beacon tracking, where we only track a spacecraft when it sends a, a beacon back to us. Um, so a lot of technologies that we're, we're looking into for the future. Um, and again, I think it's, it's where I am right now is, is pretty fun in my career because uh, the deep space network and Voyager are, are intimately tied together. And uh, I can't talk about one without talking about the other. Fantastic. So, thank you. I think that's my last side. So, I will stop my share. That is great. So, saying, um, Charlie was unable to connect to us. So, it works actually pretty good. So, this, so you have the stage all for yourself. <laughs> we will get we will get Charlie to come back. Yes. Okay. Uh, he he sent such a uh, also interesting PowerPoint. Um, so. We are usually what we do in these webinars, uh, we open the floor for questions at this point. Um, I have a question for you to start, to kickstart, and people can raise their hands. Um, and I see that uh, there are some questions in the chat, but uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand and uh, me or Rachel will call up on you. So Susie, I had a question for you in terms of who inspired you to go? One, one of the things we had in the original webinars 
we, we call up Margie Kiverson and Nancy Cooker and all these women that were trailblazers, like, and, you know, there were, we talk a lot about within the outreach of SHIELD that um, now there are more, but still there is not a whole lot of female yeah, um, in yeah. this position. So I, I wanted to hear from you and it's very informal in terms of your mentors, any challenges that you felt as a female engineering or maybe um, like as Margie like to say opportunities as well. Opportunities, yeah, 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 yeah. I think, um, you know, I was in high school, I was good in math. You know, I like math and science. I had a particular math teacher that um, uh, he himself had two daughters. So I think he was really into supporting uh, women and young ladies and encouraging them. He went, he wanted me to go to the Air Force Academy because he was an Air Force grad, but uh, oh. I, did, I didn't do that. But he did, he did, uh, you know, provide a, a sense of, you can do it, go out and do it. When I went, the, one of the reasons I went to Whitman College is because I didn't, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I had a lot of, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to go into economics or I, I like math and science, but you can take math a lot of different directions. And so I, I went to a liberal arts college to get some experience. Um, at the same time, I knew that if I went to Whitman and I decided I really wanted to be an engineer, um, I could get in on this program to go to Caltech, which I knew was a great school. And so that's, to, that's how yeah. I did that. Yeah, you know, and Caltech, especially in the 80s, early 80s is not known for having a lot of females. Um, so how was that? <laughs> yeah, how was that experience coming? You know, uh, I'm a daughter of a physicist and my sister is too a physicist, but I remember the shock. Uh, come into physics and say, wow, we're the only ones. <laughs> yeah, there were not, there were not a lot of women there. Now I was an undergrad. Um, and I think part of survive Caltech is a hard school. And, and, and part of surviving there was just, um, I think I was really glad that I didn't go there as a freshman, you know, when they have, everybody's a smart valedictorian and somebody ends up getting C's and D's and F's. How, how do you, how well does that 18 year old take that. So I kind of, when I went to Caltech, I kind of looked at that as my, my grad school in a way, like I'd succeeded at one school already. So, you know, the first, the first C I got wasn't too, too much of a shock. It did. <laughs> I knew I was, I knew I could do well someplace else. So, right. um, yeah. and um, I think I got involved. I've always been involved with uh, swimming. So I've always had sports teams to be involved with and, and, um, Generally, they were they were co-ed, but there were enough women on it that you you that you found got to, you found a niche outside of just the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I honestly never really felt that the perf certainly not at Whit Whitman. Whitman was a very because it was a liberal arts college. I think it was a very uh, warm environment, and I can mean I can remember spending hours uh, with my physics teacher. Um, you know, helping me, but just kind of mentoring me. And at, at Caltech, I think um, um, it worked out okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I never felt like I was slighted because I was a female um, in that in that sense. Although there's not very many females there, so the social the social environment was was pretty bad. The social was more challenging. <laughs> the social yeah. was more challenging than the academic. Yeah, I have an, another ask. very quick question. Then sure. uh, there is a question in the chat. What about managing um, Voyager versus other spacecraft in terms of it's, um, um, you know, I, I remember when I went to the first Voyager team meeting, it really felt like I'm crushing a party that were happening for decades. Oh. And there is a whole, <laughs> yeah, no, but a there is a whole of... inner conversation that is fascinating to learn people that work for many decades and it's so nice you have this short you know give and take that you already yeah but I how, actually, yeah I totally how is that in other, other missions um I well you know to comment on the Voyager one I was I was surprised at the, the first couple SSGs and you know these guys have been to SSGs for 40 years with each other you know and <laughs> I know and I know it's different. hard to be the new person in that for sure and then and then they have the same arguments <laughs> year in and year out. It's like a married couple for 50 exactly, years. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, 
on other missions, um, I think, well, I think uh, I might change it a lot. Uh, you know, each mission has, it does have its own kind of culture and flavor. Cassini is a big mission, you know, they had like, well, and Voyager was originally a big in mission. Now with five, five instruments versus 11, it's smaller. But when I was on Cassini, it was 12 instruments. And, and so 12 science teams and, you know, your science meeting would have 200, over 200 people at it all the time and lots of topics. And so it almost, it almost ended up with little uh, subgroups there. It, the bigger the mission, the more you're sort of uh, part, your, your, your team feeling is part of your immediate team, maybe more than the overall project. I think oh, for uh -huh. Voyager, you know, with 12 people uh, in, on the engineering team, it's, it's definitely like a family. And uh, that can be good and that can be bad because I always, you know, I always say, well, if you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and you just don't have a good day, you know exactly how to push, you know, the other team members buttons or, you know, just like your sister, or if you, you know, want to get, you want to get your sister angry, you know exactly how to do it because you've lived with them for so long. Right, right, that, right. Sometimes that happens a little bit on the project too. Um, I know, I, I remember feeling, I have a question from, uh, I'm going to, take a couple of questions that already some were written directly to me and some open to everybody. Nick asked, Nick Ross, if you want to ask yourself, I can just read it. I thought Nick was asking, what can the Voyager teach us about managing a team for a long-term mission? There is all this conversation about an interstellar probe. And I know I spoke with a social professor like Janet Vertezi trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to pass, and even within S.H.I.E.L.D., we're always talking, passing the baton to the next generation, bringing up the younger people. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, it is, it, a long mission will have challenges with uh, turnover, even, even if you work on the project for, say, 30 years, that, that one person will have built up so much knowledge. You can have all the base, all the perfect documentation and but that person still has has things in their head that they know this is what i notice um and, talking to a lot of uh, the folks in voyager that uh, work with um the data that so much of the knowledge is in their heads it's their intuition that built upon decades working with that data yeah and that is really hard to capture yeah so i think you have to i think you have to plan from that from the outset i know the Interstellar probes working with some some organizations that that specialize in knowledge capture, um, and you may want to plan to have a you know some kind of a mentorship rotation program. You know, just uh, keep that as part of your budget. Um, the difficulty is always keeping, <laughs> always getting funding from NASA. You know, that's actually I know, that that's is, one that of the is, most difficult things, and that. Right. that that depends on your government and who the president is. And, and I, and I, you know, as you know, I sat in many senior reviews trying to push for that, passing the baton. It's very important for Voyager to have that. We have a question about the lifetime of Voyager and I can answer that, but I think it would be better. So um, Voyager will probably last, now everything, I, I preference this by saying everything is single string on both spacecraft. So one thing could break one day and we'd lose the mission. Um, but assuming that we're, we're able to keep going on this process of just uh, turning off instrument heaters and then finally instruments and just stepping down as the power diminishes, we're, we're out in the late 2020s before the mission ends, 2028, 2029. My, yeah, I've said this, I've been on the record for this for many years. My personal goal is to have, to make it to the 50th launch anniversary. So we definitely have to get out to at least 2027 with one spacecraft. And hopefully there won't be any pan pandemic because I want the biggest in-person party exactly. I can get. NASA, exactly. JPL, Caltech to pay for, or, or the Planetary Society or whoever, you know, I, I can remember after the Neptune encounter, um, the Planetary Society sponsored a super cool party at JPL and um, 
Chuck Berry, a real li live and in person, came onto the steps of JPL and played um, Johnny Be Good. We had for the 35th anniversary, it also was beautiful um, with uh, Andrian playing the um, golden record of some of the images of the yeah. golden record and um, the Bulgarian Shepherd. Was, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, we won't get Chuck yeah. Berry back in person, but I think we can exactly. think of something good, maybe a, exactly. contem a contemporary of his to, uh, to celebrate with. So, I, uh, There is another question on... Um, that is more early career. Also the, the webinars from SHIELD, some of them we are trying to help um, people in early career um, how to succeed in their path, in the career path. And one of the questions is, what is the best path to get to JPL? Um. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I would say JPL is a great place to work. Um, and, uh, you know, it is in Southern California, but you know, who knows? Once we're out of pandemic, maybe more teleworking will will be the the norm. Um, not that not that I, I love Southern California because I can swim outside all the time, <laughs> but uh, um, and it's got beaches and oceans and things. Um, but I think you know, uh, JPL posts their jobs online. I would uh, I would apply to those. Apply to the internships that they post online. I think um, the internship, that's what I was going to mention. It's a, it's a great way yeah. to start to get your foot in the door and stop experiencing JPL. Yeah. So I, I mean, that's mostly what I can say is just apply through through internships and, and summer, they have summer jobs, they have postdoc research fellows, NASA does, and you can get onto those and use those at JPL as well. Fantastic, so. Susie. Maybe the last question is uh, from Heather, and then we are reaching the top of the hour already. Um, which opportunities, if you got more opportunities to work um, the longer you are in the field? Uh, to ask that question again, Mara. So uh, Heather was asking, did you get more opportunities oh, the longer see. you were in the field? Uh, yeah, I did. You know, as part of getting known, I think I was. I'm. I'm a pretty calm person most of the time. <laughs> I think as I get older, I get more annoyed by things, but I, I realize when I'm, I'm young, you got to just kind of let what makes a great, uh, you know, a director <laughs> and a manager. For yeah, you got to let yeah. stuff roll off. But um, I every one of those, you know, when I went through my career, every step along the way was an advancement. You know, I started as the introduction engineer on Voyager. When I moved to Mars Observer, I was in a team of three mission planners that I got to head up. I moved to Cassini. The team went to about 40 people, actually. Uh, and the Spitzer Science Center had 120 or so at, it, at its height. So every, every step was a little higher up. Um, I, think, I think my personal strengths are um, my communication skills. And I mentioned the fact that when I went and worked in a science center, that was a great knowledge skill set to get in order to be able to branch communications between how the scientists are thinking and the engineers. You know, the engineers are cool. They want to build cool things. They want to put rovers on, on Mars and landing it. You know, that's, that's cool. And driving it is cool. What they actually do, yeah, well, maybe... Maybe the, less. maybe maybe the samples are interesting. Maybe they're not. But you know, it's it's you you gotta it, to the geologist. That's like heaven. You know, getting a sample right. from Mars and and so so you know being able oh, to right. so, bridge so, so, that, so those thoughts, those cultures, uh, I think is important. And I think that's one of my strengths. So see, I'm going to post a survey for uh, future webinars in the chat for people to fill out before they leave. And my last, last question for you, as you were going up your career, who you, were your mentors? And I know I'm asking that because um, I, I have this conversation with a lot of other um, female professors or anybody that come from mm -hmm. a different, slightly different background um, that is harder as you go up to find a mentor. You, you will find a mentor um, maybe not with your background and it's fine as well. It's great. 
but some of the challenges that you face, you will look around and it will be harder to find a mentor. So I, I'm curious to know about you. I, well, I, I, when I can say, well, the way J, JPL is set up, you know, you have a, you work on a project, but it's a matrix or, organization. So you have a supervisor that has people doing similar jobs as you on, on many different projects. So, so that's, that person is kind of the person that is there to, will, will, right. to mentor you and help you find the next job when your project leaves. Um, but I, I have had a couple mentors and I would say one, one, um, you know, I, I, uh, one is Dave Gallagher and he was, he was the project manager on Spitzer. So, um, and, uh, he helped me, he helped me get the job as the director, the director for, I'm pretty confident because I didn't even know Mike Watkins when I got the job, which is pretty astonishing. So, um, and, uh, so some of the project managers also, I think, um, the interesting thing about JPL is, is you do go from project to project and one, in one role, I, I might be the project manager on one project and, and it, and have an employee underneath me. And it might flip on the next project where I'm working for that employee who used to be my employee. So, so never screw up your relationships because right. These, right. most people stay at JPL for a fairly long time. And, and, People will crisscross on who's who's higher up, depending on which project. No, yeah, so, yeah. So my my advice to JPL is is definitely don't don't um, don't cause strife in relationships. Because I loved when I was you, there. You never know how that's going to come back and affect you. So you know you may have a boss you don't like, you may have a teacher you don't like, but you learn how to work with that and. Uh, you know, if you have a boss you don't like, and then all of a sudden you become their boss, you know, how are you going to handle that? It's something to right. think about. So, <laughs> right. right. And it's a small, as Heather is pointing, especially space physics, it's a small field. So we all, we're all enthusiastic about this. And, yeah. Know, and I can probably course. say space physics could use more, more, more diversity, right? I think yeah. everybody would, yeah. would, would yeah. say yeah. that. So, um, um, I, I, you see more of it now because I, I think there's more emphasis put on it too. But uh, it, it, it's, it's good. It could use more, and I think it's going to bring different views. We're trying to push it with with Shield as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first topic y'all mentioned, um, you're you're talking about your backgrounds. I get asked all the time. So was your dad a physicist? <laughs> like, and yeah. I'm like. No, my dad has no such skills. It, my mom was the one that was more analytical. Not, not yeah. my dad. My dad's a people person. <laughs> but this is assumption. Yeah, my dad was, uh, he, he worked for a warehouse. He worked for a lumber company. He was a market research guy. He wasn't an engineer at all. So, Susie, thank you so much. This was You're a welcome. total delight. And I think... We are going to have more of those Voyager stories are so delightful. And Susie, you kickstarted wonderfully. Good, um, good. It was fantastic. All right, well, I'm glad everybody We're going to it. post it on the web. Sorry, the image was a bit jittery. My internet today is pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> we pandemic. all get used to that this, these times. So yeah. Great, thank you so much, Susie. It was okay. delightful and thank you everybody to um, join. If you can fill out the survey to help us plan for future webinars. If you have a speaker or a theme you're interested, please uh, fill it out. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, Susie. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Have a nice weekend. You too, guys.